you found Mafia Legends. The best criminal channel on all of YouTube. Sit and relax, and I will tell you a story. I was around the stand from morning till night, and I was learning more and more every day. By the time I was 13, I was collecting numbers and selling fireworks. I used to get the cab drivers to buy six packs of beer for me, and then I'd sell them at a markup to the kids in the schoolyard. I was acting like a mini fence for some of the neighborhood's juvenile burglars. I'd front them the money and then sell the radio, portable, or box of sweaters they glommed to one of the guys around the cab stand. Before big money holidays like Easter and Mother's Day, instead of going to school, I'd go cashing with Johnny Mazzala. Johnny, who lived across the street from the cab stand, was a junkie horse player, and every once in a while, he would take me out and we'd go cashing counterfeit 20s he picked up from Beansy, the counterfeiter in Ozone Park for 10 cents on the dollar. We'd go from store to store, neighborhood to neighborhood, and Johnny would wait in the car, and I'd run in and buy something for a buck or two with the fake 20. Johnny taught me how to soften up the counterfeit bills with cold coffee and cigarette ashes, the night before and leave them out to dry. He taught me to pretend I was in a hurry, when I went up to the cashier. He also told me, never to carry more than one bill on me at a time. That way, if you get caught, you can pretend that somebody passed it off on you. He was right. It worked. I was caught a couple of times, but I could always cry my way out. I was just a kid. I'd start to yell and cry, and say I had to tell my mother what happened. That she'd beat me up for losing the money. Then I'd run out of the store fast as I could, and we'd be off for another neighborhood. We'd usually get a couple of days in a neighborhood, until the twenties started showing up in the local banks and they'd alert the stores. Then the cashiers would have a list of the fake bills serial numbers tacked up right next to the register, and we'd have to change neighborhoods. At the end of a day's caching, we'd have so many $2 purchases of donuts and cigarettes and razor blades and soap piled up in the back of the car, we couldn't see out the rear window. At Christmas, Tuddy taught me how to drill holes in the trunks of junk Christmas trees he'd get for nothing, and then I'd stuff the holes with loose branches. I'd stuff so many branches into those holes, that even those miserable spindly trees looked full. Then we'd sell them for premium prices, usually at night and mostly around the Euclid Avenue subway stop. It took a day or two before the branches came loose and began to fall apart. The trees would collapse even faster, once they were weighed down with decorations. We were always scheming. Everything was a scheme. Tutty got me a job unloading deliveries at a high-class Italian food store, just so I could toss the store's most expensive items through the windows of Tutty's cabs, which he had parked strategically nearby. It wasn't that Tutty or Lenny or Paul needed the stuff, the imported olive oil, prosciutto, or tuna fish. The Varys had more than enough money to buy the store a hundred times over. It was just that stuff that was stolen, always tasted better than anything bought. I remember years later, when I was doing pretty well in the stolen credit card business, Polly was always asking me for stolen credit cards, whenever he and his wife, Phyllis, were going out for the night. Polly called stolen cards Muldoons, and he always said that liquor tastes better on a Muldoon. The fact that a guy like Paul Vario, a capo in the Lucchese crime family, would even consider going out on a social occasion with his wife, and run the risk of getting caught using a stolen card, might surprise some people. But if you knew wise guys, you would know right away that the best part of the night for Polly came from the fact that he was getting over on somebody. It wasn't the music or the floor show or the food, and he loved food, or even that he was going out with Phyllis, who he adored. The real thrill of the night for Polly, this biggest pleasure, was that he was robbing someone and getting away with it. After I was at the cab stand about six months, I began helping the Varios with the card and dice games they ran. I would spend the days with Bruno Facciolo assembling the crap game tables, which were just like the ones they have in Vegas. I spent my nights steering the high rollers from various pickup spots in the neighborhood, such as the candy store under the Liberty Avenue L, or Al and Evelyn's Delicatessen on Pitkin Avenue, to the apartments and storefronts, where we were having games that night. A couple of times we had the games in the basement of my own school, Junior High School 149, on Euclid Avenue. Babe Vario bought the school custodian. I kept an eye out for cops, especially the plainclothesmen from the division or headquarters, who used to shake down the games in those days. I didn't have to worry too much about the local cops. They were already on the payroll. It got so that I could always make a plainclothesman. 
They usually had their shirts outside their pants, to cover their guns and handcuffs. They used the same dirty black Plymouths all the time. We even had their plate numbers. They had a way of walking through a block, or driving a car that just said, don't fuck with me, I'm a cop. I had radar for them. I knew. Those games were fabulous. There were usually between 30 and 40 guys playing. We had rich garment center guys. Businessmen. Restaurant owners. Bookmakers. Union guys. Doctors. Dentists. This was long before it was so easy to fly out to Vegas, or drive down to Atlantic City for the night. There was also just about every wise guy in the city coming to the games. The games themselves were actually run by professionals, but the Varios handled the money. They kept the books and the cash box. The guys who ran the game, got a flat fee or a percentage depending on the deal they cut. The people who ran the games for Polly, were the same kind of professionals who would run games in casinos or carnivals. The card games had professional dealers, and the crap games had box men and stick men, just like regular casinos. There were doormen, usually guys from the cab stand, who checked out everyone who got in the game, and there were lone sharks who worked for Polly, who picked up some of the action. Every pot was cut 5 or 6% for the house, and there was a bartender who kept the drinks coming. I used to make coffee and sandwich runs to Al and Evelyn's delicatessen, until I realized I could make a lot more money if I made the sandwiches myself. It was a lot of work, but I made a few more bucks. I had only been doing that a couple of weeks, when Al and Evelyn caught me on the street. They took me into the store. They wanted to talk to me, they said. Business was bad, they said. Since I started making sandwiches, they had lost lots of the card game business. They had a deal. If I went back to buying the sandwiches from them, they'd cut me in for five cents on every card game dollar I spent. It sounded great, but I didn't jump at the opportunity. I wanted to savor it. I was being treated like an adult. All right, Al says, with Evelyn frowning at him, seven cents on the dollar. Good, I said, but I was feeling great. It was my first kickback, and I was still only 13. It was a glorious time. Wise guys were all over the place. It was 1956, just before Appalachian, before the wise guys began having all the trouble and crazy Joey Gallo decided to take on his boss, Joe Prophesy, in an all-out war. It was when I met the world. It was when I first met Jimmy Burke. He used to come to the card games. He couldn't have been more than 24 or 25 at the time, but he was already a legend. He'd walk in the door and everybody who worked in the joint would go wild. He'd give the doorman a hundred, just for opening the door. He shoved hundreds in the pockets of the guys who ran the games. The bartender got a hundred just for keeping the ice cubes cold. I mean, the guy was a sport. He started out giving me five bucks, every time I got him a sandwich or a beer. Two beers, two five dollar bills. Win or lose, the guy had money on the table and people got their tips. After a while, when he got to know me a little bit and he got to know that I was with Paul and the Varios, he started to give me twenty dollar tips when I brought him his sandwich. He was sawbucking me to death. Twenty here. Twenty there. He wasn't like anyone else I had ever met. The Varios and most of the Italian guys were all pretty cheap. They'd go for a buck once in a while, but they resented it. They hated losing the green. Jimmy was from another world. He was a one-man parade. He was also one of the city's biggest hijackers. He loved to steal. I mean, he enjoyed it. He loved to unload the hijacked trucks himself, until the sweat was pouring down his face. He must have knocked over hundreds of trucks a year, most of them coming and going from the airports. Most hijackers take the truck driver's license as a warning. The driver knows that you know where he lives, and if he cooperates too much with the cops or the insurance company he's in trouble. Jimmy got his nickname, Jimmy the Gent, because he used to take the driver's license, just like everybody else, except Jimmy used to stuff a $50 bill into the guy's wallet, before taking off. I can't tell you how many friends he made out at the airport because of that. People loved him. Drivers used to tip off his people about rich loads. At one point things got so bad, the cops had to assign a whole army to try to stop him, but it didn't work. It turned out that Jimmy made the cops his partners. Jimmy could corrupt a saint. He said bribing cops was like feeding elephants at the zoo. All you need is peanuts. Jimmy was the kind of guy, who cheered for the crooks in movies. He named his two sons, Frank James Burke, and Jesse James Burke. He was a big guy, 
and he knew how to handle himself. He looked like a fighter. He had a broken nose, and he had a lot of hands. If there was just the littlest amount of trouble, he'd be all over you in a second. He'd grab a guy's tie and slam his chin into the table, before the guy knew he was in a war. If the guy was lucky, Jimmy would let him live. Jimmy had a reputation for being wild. He'd whack you. There was no question, Jimmy could plant you just as fast as shake your hand. It didn't matter to him. At dinner he could be the nicest guy in the world, but then he could blow you away for dessert. He was very scary, and he scared some very scary fellows. Nobody really knew where they stood with him, but he was also smarter than most of the guys he was around. He was a great earner. Jimmy always brought in money for Polly and the crew, and that, in the end, is why his craziness was tolerated. On Henry's 14th birthday, Tuddy and Lenny Vario presented Henry with a card in the bricklayer's local. Even then, in 1957, a job in the construction workers' union paid well, and entitled its members to extensive health care and other fringe benefits, such as paid vacations and sick leave. It was a union card for which most of the hard-working men in the neighborhood, would have paid dearly. Henry was given the card, so that he could be put on a building contractor's payroll as a no-show, and his salary divided among the varies. He was also given the card, to facilitate the pickup of the daily policy bets and loan shark payments from local construction sites. For months, instead of going to school, Henry made pickups at various construction projects, and then brought everything back to the basement of the Presto Pizzeria, where the accounts were assembled. I was doing very nicely. I liked going to the construction jobs. Everybody knew who I was. They all knew I was with Paul. Sometimes, because I was a member of the union, they let me wet down all the new brick with a fire hose. I loved doing that. It was fun. I liked to watch the way the brick changed color. Then one day I got home from the pizza joint, and my father was waiting for me with his belt in one hand, and a letter in the other. The letter was from the school's truant officer. It said that I hadn't been to school in months. Here I was lying to my folks, that I was going every day. I even used to take my books like I was legit, and then I'd leave them at the cab stand. Meanwhile I'm telling Tuddy that my classes have already let out for the summer, and everything was okay with my parents. Part of my situation in those days was, that I was juggling everybody in the air at once. I got such a beating from my father that night, that the next day Tuddy and the guys wanted to know what had happened to me. I told them. I even said that I was afraid I'd have to give up my bricklayer's job. Tuddy told me not to worry, and he motions a couple of the guys from the cab stand and me to go for a ride. We're driving around, and I can't figure out what's happening. Finally Tuddy pulls the car over. He pointed to the mailman delivering mail across the street. Is that your mailman? He asked. I nodded yes. Then, out of the blue, the two guys got out of the car and snatched the mailman. I couldn't believe it. In broad daylight, Tuddy and some of the guys go out and kidnap my mailman. The guy was crammed in the back of the car and he was turning gray. I was ashamed to look at him. Nobody said anything. Finally we all got back to the pizzeria, and Tuddy asked him if he knew who I was. Me. The guy nodded his head yes. Tuddy asked him if he knew where I lived. The guy nodded yes again. Then Tuddy said from now on, all mail from the school gets delivered to the pizza parlor, and if the guy ever again delivers another letter from the school to my house, Tuddy's going to shove him in the pizza oven feet first. That was it. No more letters from truant officers. No more letters from the school. In fact, no more letters from anybody. Finally, after a couple of weeks, my mother had to go down to the post office and complain. Henry rarely bothered to go back to school again. It was no longer required. It wasn't even relevant. There was something ludicrous about sitting through lessons in 19th century American democracy, when he was living in a world of 18th century Sicilian thievery. One night I was in the pizzeria, and I heard a noise. I looked out the window, and saw this guy running up Pitkin Avenue toward the store, screaming at the top of his lungs, I've been shot. He was the first person I ever saw, who was shot. At first it looked like he was carrying a package of raw meat from the butchers, all wrapped in white string, but when he got close I saw that it was his hand. He had put his hand up to stop the blast of a shotgun. Larry Bellello, the old guy who was the cook at the pizzeria, and did 25 years for a cop killing, yelled at me to close the door. I did. I already knew that Polly didn't want anybody dying in the place. 
Instead of letting him in, I grabbed one of the chairs and took it out on the street, so he could sit down and wait for the ambulance. I took off my apron and wrapped it around his hand to stop the blood. The guy was bleeding so bad, that my apron was soaked with blood in a few seconds. I went inside and got some more aprons. By the time the ambulance came, the guy was practically dead. When the excitement died down, Larry Bellello was really pissed. He said I was a jerk. I was stupid. He said I wasted eight aprons on the guy, and I remember feeling bad. I remember feeling that maybe he was right. About this time a guy from the south opened a cab stand around the corner, on Glenmore Avenue. He called it the Rebel Cab Company. The guy was a real hick. He was from Alabama or Tennessee. He had been in the army, and just because he'd married a local girl, he thought all he had to do was open his place and compete with Tutty. He lowered his prices. He worked around the clock. He set up special discounts, to take people from the last subway and bus stops on Liberty Avenue, to the far reaches of Howard Beach and the Rockaways. He either didn't know how things worked, or he was dumb. Tutty had sent people to talk to the guy. They said he was stubborn. Tutty went to talk to him. Tutty told him that there wasn't enough business for two companies. There probably was, but by now Tutty just didn't want the guy around. Finally one day after Tutty has been banging things around the cab stand all day long, he tells me to meet him at the cab stand after midnight. I couldn't believe it. I was really excited. For the whole day I couldn't think of anything else. I knew he had something planned for the rebel cab stand, but I didn't know what it was. When I got to the cab stand, Tutty was waiting for me. He had a five-gallon drum of gasoline in the back of his car. We drove around the neighborhood for a while, until the lights were out in the offices of the Rebel Cab Company, on Glenmore Avenue. Then Tutty gave me a hammer with a rag wrapped around its head. He nodded toward the curb. I walked up to the first of the Rebel Cabs, squeezed my eyes, and swung. Glass flew all over me. I went to the next cab and did it again. Meanwhile Tutty was wrinkling newspapers and pouring gasoline all over them. He'd soak the papers and shove them through the windows I had just smashed. As soon as he finished, Tutty took the empty can and started hopping like mad up the block. You'd never know Tutty lost a leg, except when he had to run. He said it was dumb for both of us, to be standing in the middle of the street with an empty gasoline can, when the fires began. He gave me a fistful of matches, and told me to wait until he signaled from the corner. When he finally waved, I lit the first match. Then I set the whole matchbook on fire, just like I'd been taught. I quickly threw it through the broken cab window in case the gas fumes flashed back. I went to the second cab and lit another matchbook, and then I did the third and then the fourth. It was while I was next to the fourth cab that I felt the first explosion. I could feel the heat and one explosion after another, except by then I was running so fast I never had a chance to look back. At the corner I could see Tutty. He was reflected in the orange flames. He was waving the empty gasoline can like a track coach as though I needed anyone to tell me to hurry. Henry was 16 years old, when he was arrested for the first time. He and Paul's son Lenny, who was 15, had been given a Texaco credit card by Tutty, and told to go to the gas station on Pennsylvania Avenue and Linden Boulevard, to buy a couple of snow tires for Tutty's wife's car. Tutty didn't even check to see if the card was stolen. He just gave me the card and sent us to the gas station, where we were known. If I'd known it was a stolen card, I still could have scored. If I'd known the card was hot, I would have given it to the guy in the gas station and said, here, get yourself the $50 reward for returning it and give me half of it. Even if it was bad I would have earned on the card, except Tutty wouldn't have had any tires. Instead, Lenny and I drive over to the place and buy the tires. The guy had to put them on the rims, so we paid for them on the card and drove around for about an hour. When we got back, the cops were there. They were hiding around on the side. I walk in the place and two detectives jump out and say that I'm under arrest. Lenny took off. They cuffed me and took me to the Liberty Avenue station. In the precinct they shoved me in the pens, and I was playing the wise guy. I'll be out in an hour, I'm telling the cops. I didn't do nothing. Real George Raft. Tutty and Lenny had always told me, never to talk to the cops. Never tell them anything. At one point one of the cops said, he wanted me to sign something. He had to be nuts. I'm not signing anything, I tell him. Tutty and Lenny said, all I had to give them was my name, and at first they didn't believe my name was Henry Hill. I took a smack from one of the cops, 
just because he wouldn't believe a kid running around with the people I was running with, could have a name like Hill. In less than an hour, Louis Dellenhauser showed up at the precinct. Cop out Louis, the lawyer. Lenny had run back to the cab stand and said I had been pinched on the credit card. That's when they sent Louis. They took care of everything. After the precinct the cops took me down for the arraignment, and when the judge set $500 bail, the money was put right up and I was free. When I turned around to walk out of the court, I could see all of the varios were standing in the back of the room. Pauly wasn't there because he was serving 30 days on a contempt hearing, but everybody else was smiling and laughing, and started hugging me and kissing me and banging me on the back. It was like a graduation. Tuddy kept yelling, you broke your cherry. You broke your cherry. It was a big deal. After we left the court, Lenny and Big Lenny and Tuddy took me to Vincent's Clam Bar in Little Italy for scungilly and wine. They made it like a party. Then, when we got back to the cab stand, everybody was waiting for me and we partied some more. Two months later, Cop Out Louis copped me out to an attempted petty larceny, and I got a six month suspended sentence. Maybe I could have done better. Looking back, it sure was a dumb way to start a yellow sheet but in those days it was no big thing having a suspended sentence on your record. And I felt so grateful they paid the lawyer, so that my mother and father didn't ever have to find out. But by now I'm getting nervous. My father is getting worse and worse. I had found a gun in his basement, and had taken it across the street to show Tuddy, and then I put it back. A couple of times Tuddy said, he wanted to borrow the gun for some friends of his. I didn't want to lend it, but I didn't want to say no to Tuddy. In the end I started to lend Tuddy the gun, and get it back after a day or two. Then I'd wrap the gun up just exactly how I found it, and put it back on the top shelf behind the pipes in the cellar. One day I went to get the gun for Tuddy, and I saw that it was missing. I knew that my father knew what I was doing. He didn't say anything, but I knew he knew. It was like waiting for the electric chair. I was almost 17. I went to the recruitment office and tried to sign up. I thought that was a good way of getting my father off my back, and keeping Tuddy and Paul from thinking I was mad at them. The guys at the recruitment office said I had to wait until I was 17, and then my parents or guardian could sign me up. I went home and told my father, I wanted to enlist in the paratroopers. I told him he had to sign me in. He started to smile, and he called my mother and the whole family. My mother was nervous, but my father was really happy. That afternoon I went to the DeKalb Avenue recruitment office and signed up. The next day I went to the cab stand, and told Tuddy what I'd done. He thought I was crazy. He said he was going to get Paul. Now Polly shows up, very concerned. He sits me down alone. He looks me in the eye and asks me was there anything wrong, was there anything I wasn't telling him. No, I said. Are you sure? He asked. Yeah, I said. Then he got very quiet. We're in the back room of the cab stand surrounded by wise guys. He's got two carloads of shooters on the street. The place is as safe as a tomb and he's whispering. He says if I want to get out of it, he can fix it with the recruitment office. He can buy me back the papers. No, thanks, I said. I might as well do the time. And that will be end of that episode. Make sure to like and comment this video. Please subscribe to the channel so we can bring you more mob stories.